So we'll be talking about checkpoint inhibition therapy for non-metastatic, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The majority of the research in this disease has been in refractory or first-line bladder cancer, but there's some new exciting day which I'll be presenting in a few moments. These are my disclosures. I also root for the Rangers, the Mets, the Jets. Not doing too well these days. Bronco, well, you root for the Broncos. Remember, we had a great week a couple of weeks ago where the where both the Rangers and the Jets beat the Denver teams, which I thought was kind of kind of nice. So uh, this is our bladder staging map. As we see, we'd be talking and focusing on this stage of the disease, carcinoma in situ, the TA or the T1 disease. Uh, the car this is really the area where we look at intravesical therapy. Uh, we know that about three quarters of bladder cancers are non-muscle invasive. It's an expensive tumor to treat due to the long-term management. And in fact, if we're starting to look at these checkpoint inhibitors, that's also a huge expense. But the real question I have in my mind is if we can avoid cystectomy, is that having a, a, an important impact on health care costs? And also, as David had mentioned before, in an elderly patient, they may not do well with cystectomy uh, after having local disease. The recurrence rate is about 40 to 80 percent, progression about 10 to 50 percent. Low grade disease rarely progresses, high grade disease can progress to death or to metastatic disease. And intravesical therapy can reduce the recurrence and progression. Cystectomy is standard for BCG, refractory, high grade, non muscle invasive bladder cancer. So, in the management, uh, initially we will resect all visible disease and consider enhanced cystoscopy, a repeat TUR if it's PT1. If it's high grade, we would give intravesical therapy. Low grade, low volume, usually followed with cystoscopy only. BCG, which is a standard of care, as we heard from the last talk, can reduce recurrence, progression, and death, must be given for at least a year and up to three years, and is generally superior to chemotherapy such as mitomycin. And uh, the only agent that's approved by the FDA for BCG failures is uh, valrubicin, and generally people don't use this, although there are other agents, as we heard in the last talk, interferon, gemcitabine, uh, these can salvage patients uh, after BCG failure. So this is the best known immunotherapy. Uh, f uh, it was FDA approved in 1990. It's a standard of care for non-muscle invasive disease. And this is the, I think one of the important points here is this is immunologically different than checkpoint inhibition therapy. It's a complex pathway and, and the exact mechanism, uh, there are probably multiple mechanisms of action, but uh, the exact mechanisms of resistance as we heard in the last talk are unclear. It's internalized by both the urethelial cells as well as the immune cells, and a number of cytokines are released as well as chemokines, and uh, this will present the antigens to the T cells and then uh, cause an anti-tumor effect. Uh, less than 5% of patients will develop serious complications, and again, this is important to remember because of the, what we're going to talk about with the checkpoints a little bit later, and these commonly include fever, hematuria, as well as granulomas, prostatitis. So this is, again, the pathway of, of, of BCG. Uh, there, this is internalized, as I said before, by both the uh, urethelial cancer cell as well as the T cells. These antigens are presented by the dendritic cells, and a variety of different cytokines are released, causing an activated T cell, which attacks the tumor cell in that particular situation. So this is our best understanding of the pathway. There may be upregulation. Actually, some studies have shown that after this inflammatory process occurs, there's upregulation of PD-1, PD-L1 on both the tumor cells as well as the immune cells. So that actually may prime uh, these particular cancer cells to, to checkpoint inhibition therapy later on. Uh, Dr. Cookson has already gone through these definitions uh, of BCG failures. BCG relapse occurs, uh, or relapsing is a recurrence after achieving six months of a disease-free survival. Intolerant is a less than adequate course of BCG. The, refractors are the refractory patients are those who don't achieve a disease-free survival at six months after the initial treatment or uh, three months after a uh, uh, therapy if they've been retreated, and then the resistance of those who basically failed in NOVO. Uh, as far as uh, the AUSUO guidelines, uh, we, you could completely resect uh, a high-grade uh, papillary tumor prior to PCG, and um, you may want to consider maintenance for a year in a high-risk patient who completely respond to induction BCG. Uh, you maintain it for three years as well. These are just some forest plots looking at the superiority of BCG to uh, standard chemotherapy, uh, mitomycin, adriamycin, and again, these all seem to favor BCG in terms of their uh, recurrence. 
Uh, also, we see the same thing for papillary carcinoma in situ in favor of BCG uh, com compared to uh, other treatments. Just lost here, hang on. So um, as far as relapse and salvage re res regimens are concerned with intermediate and high-risk patients with persistent TA or CIS, um, try another course of BCG. Uh, if you, uh, the patient is fit for surgery with high grade T1 disease, and this is a situation that we'd like to avoid. After a single course of induction therapy, you would order, or you, and they don't respond, you would order, order <clears throat> you would consider a radical cystectomy. Uh, and then the other situation, too, is you don't, you don't want to prescribe extra BCG to those patients who are intolerant, uh, who have uh, uh, developed side effects from the drug uh, within six months of two induction therapies. Let me just skip on here and just keep on pushing this backwards. So uh, we don't really, as I said before, valrubicin is, is an approved agent, and the number of agents that are now in, in play as far as BCG is concerned, most of these are types of immune therapy. Uh, these are being compared to agents such as dimcitabine and mitomycin C. Uh, again, Dr. Cookson talked about paclitaxel and docetaxel being given intravesically, as well as gemcitabine. And there are a variety of other agents. Now the mitogel is, is basically a preparation that is being released uh, on a, a, through a gel <clears throat> of mitomycin C directly into the tumor cells. Vaccines and viruses are being looked at. The vaccinovirus uh, has a phase two trial. Vigam is a VB4, uh, 445 is an anti-epicam antibody, which is fused with pseudomonas. And that's being looked at in combination with Devolumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, as well as, well as monotherapy. There are oncolytic ad uh, ad adenoviruses that are being looked at in the situation, intradermal vaccines, uh, an IL-15 super antagonist. Uh, this is felt to be better than IL-2. And then SWOG is also looking at uh, BCG strain differences, uh, as well as T cell priming. Originally, BCG was given both intradermally as well as intravesically, and the thought was by systemically giving BCG, you could induce more of an immune effect. And that's being looked at in terms of something called prime, which is a study that's, that's, that's testing that hypothesis. Uh, this was talked about before, uh, the uh, mycobacterial wall nu nucleotide acid complexes. Uh, this has about a 25% disease-free survival with carcinoma in situ. Interferon works by a different mechanism, the induction of cytokines, and uh, there's trials that have combined BCG along with interferon, showing a dose-dependent response of about 20% and a one to two six year success rate of about 40%. Uh, Mike before talked about the different strains, that there may not be so much of a great difference, but again, this is being, uh, at least was looked at a couple of years ago because of the, the shortage of BCG. And um, there's also a recombinant adenovirus that is, has interferon as a vector uh, that is being looked at intravesically. Uh, SWAG is looking at uh, a, a different form of BCG, the Tokyo BCG, because of the issues previously of BCG uh, 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 lack of, uh, uh, of access. And uh, again, uh, this is being looked in terms of equivalence. Also, SWAG is looking at something called PRIME, as I mentioned before, which is evaluating uh, T cell priming in these BCG-naive, high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. These are PPD-negative patients who receive intravesical BCG plus uh, uh, the uh, uh, priming uh, to potentially increase the immune response. Now on to checkpoint inhibitors. These are agents that have activity in a variety of different human tumors, lung cancer, a bladder cancer, tumors with high mutational rates. And um, this is actually a very, very interesting and complicated system uh, where we have a T cell that will recognize through the T cell receptor a uh, antigen that's present on the tumor cell. And then when this is activated through the PD-1, PD-L1 complex, a variety of different cytokines are released and then can cause uh, a, a anti-tumor effect. These uh, T cells will recognize the tumor cells as being foreign. And this is the normal system. The reason why the high mutational rate tumors tend to have 
a better overall response is that neoantigens are present at a higher rate. When you think of it this way, you're mutating uh, these cells at a high rate that make a lot of mutated proteins, and then these mutated proteins are recognized by the T cells, and of course, an antitumor effect comes forth. In fact, one of the <clears throat> uh, interesting facts is that the patients who are smokers, who continue to smoke when on immune therapy, actually have higher rates of response in lung cancer. It's not a reason to continue smoking, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's more in tune with this, this mutational rate. Now, you block that particular response with an antibody, and you can block either PD-1 or PDL one And there's a lot of controversy as to whether one is better than the other. There's some thought that maybe PD-L1 inhibition has fewer side effects than PD-1 inhibition. But nonetheless, this will block this immune response and will make the tumor cells invisible to the immune system. So it's almost like a cloaking device from Star Trek. They become invisible. So what about the data in bladder cancer? When we first started looking at this in 2013, uh, we had the good fortune of working with, uh, with, uh, on a phase one trial of a tezeluzumab, which is a PD-L1 inhibitor. Our first patient uh, was refractory to several different forms of chemotherapy, including MVAC, as well as gemcitabine and, and ataxane, and he responded four years when he should probably have only lived about six months afterwards. But the one important caveat is in patients who have been previously treated, there is no difference in response rates between the PD-1s and the PD-L1s. It's all about 25% overall. So that's the answer to our previous ARS question. It's about 25%. And no agent seems to be uh, more or less toxic. There's only one agent that has phase three data that supports its use in second line therapy, that's pembrolizumab. Uh, the tezeluzumab trial unfortunately failed in phase three, but I think there was a lot due to trial design in this particular situation. In first line therapy, uh, PDL1 uh, treatment is approved by the FDA, both pembrolizumab as well as tezeluzumab. And as we see here in front line, the objective response rates are about 40%, uh, and also uh, the median survivals uh, are not yet reached. Uh, duration of response that you reach means survival is about 16 months overall. So again, better than what you would expect with standard chemotherapy. Both of these are approved, but an FDA warning uh, went out very, very recently. This is the sequence we've been using now. Cisplatin-based chemotherapy taxanes for the eligible patients. For the ineligible patients, uh, 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 the uh, uh, treatment we would be, be giving is a carboplatin-based chemotherapy, then pembrolizumab. Uh, this is what, with the approval of pembrolizumab and tezeluzumab, but now, uh, what we're now seeing is the fact that there is an FDA warning, and those patients who are low levels of PDL1 expression should not be receiving these checkpoint inhibitors frontline. They receive chemotherapy, and, and we need to see the final data from the studies that uh, uh, basically cause this particular observation. So, what about non muscle invasive bladder cancer? Very, very exciting presentation at this year's ESMO uh, about Dr. DeWitt uh, from the Netherlands. And again, as I mentioned before, there may be upregulation of PDL1 in those patients who are BCG resistant. And what he did was he looked at pembrolizumab, which is a PD1 inhibitor. This was given every three weeks, like we did in the metastatic studies. These were patients who had non muscle invasive bladder cancer who had failed BCG. And the cohort that was presented was carcinoma in situ uh, and those, or those patients without papillary disease, patients with high grade T1 disease. Now, you have to limit your patient population. These are patients who do not have any evidence of autoimmune disorders. So people who may have um, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, uh, immune th thyroiditis, these are people you don't want to treat with, with checkpoint inhibition therapy. And there are studies that have looked at this particular question. You have to really evaluate the patient and see how they're doing. So patients were evaluated by cystoscopy, and the primary endpoint was complete response, uh, and uh, secondary endpoints were disease-free survival. Uh, this was an interim analysis. The data cutoff was in 2018 in April, and uh, again, 103 patients treated in, in cohort A with CIS, and 32 patients are ongoing. 71 patients discontinued therapy. Uh, persistent disease was for 32 patients. Recurrent disease, 27 patients. Adverse events, seven out of the 103, and drug-related adverse events, five. Uh, other reasons were protocol violations as well as physician decision. 
And if we look at the characteristics of the patients, as one would expect, predominantly male, predominantly Caucasian, uh, predominantly good performance status. This is, these are patients with early stage disease. Uh, and if we look at the types of, of uh, uh, histologies, carcinoma in situ with T1, 12.6%, high-grade TA, 15.5%, and then CIS alone is, 75, is about 71% overall. Uh, if you look at pd one status, uh, most of these patients uh, had, uh, about a third had positive disease, but most of these patients were either not available or had low expressions of pd one now this is what I think is the, the impressive um, uh, 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 table from the study. Complete response rate, 40 patients, almost 40% of patients had a complete tumor response. And if we look at progression to T2 disease, uh, it's no patient progressed at T2 disease from this group. Uh, and uh, stage progression was 8.7% of patients. As Dr. Cookson noted before, this, is, this data is, is early. And we see that about three quarters of the patients from this trial have an ongoing response. And um, about a quarter of patients recurred after having complete response, and one patient subsequently underwent a cystectomy. Uh, this is a uh, capital monitor curve with the median duration response at three months. Uh, the uh, uh, overall median duration has not been reached and 80% of patients had a complete response, uh, and their duration of response was of more than six months. Adverse events, if we start looking at treatment-related adverse events, it's about uh, 50, 60%. Grade threes, 26%. And these are the classic types of, of, of uh, 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 adverse events that we see with BCG, uh, with, uh, excuse me, checkpoint admission therapy. Paritis, hypothyroidism, rash, uh, these, again, are typically seen in the metastatic state. Uh, diarrhea is also something that's commonly seen as well. Pneumonitis is a long-term side effect, which has to be watched out for. Uh, and again, we have to be careful that, that, that uh, these patients are monitored carefully. We generally will use steroids to reverse these adverse events, and only uh, six patients required steroids. Uh, from th grade three to five from the immune events, colitis, this can be uh, actually life-threatening if it's not taken care of early. One percent of patients, adrenal insufficiency, again, about one percent of patients. And uh, diabetes also can occur, and once it occurs, it's type one, and they're with it for life. So, so again, you've got to look in terms of what the side effects are, how the patients are doing, in terms of how it's going to be moving forward in this disease. Variety of different trials are going on, looking with looking at checkpoint inhibition therapy in uh, BCG resistant uh, as well as BCG naive patients. The naive studies are basically combining checkpoints with uh, BCG, and then really you can name your checkpoint because uh, there are five approved by the FDA uh, for bladder cancer, but really every one of them has representation uh, in these clinical trials in early stage disease. In SWOG, we're looking at a tezolizumab. This trial is open and actively accruing patients. The target is to see a disease-free uh, survival of 30%. And uh, these patients are receiving, receiving as a tezolizumab. They're being monitored by cystoscopy. And then they're receiving maintenance up to 12 months after they initially have a response, if they do respond to treatment. So in conclusion, high mutational load makes this an ideal target for immune approaches. A BCG immune therapy is the standard of care for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. There's limited utility of chemotherapy, and the checkpoint inhibitors are, are now being evaluated, uh, and there are multiple trials that are going on to assess their, their role in this disease. Thank you for your attention.